and welcome to today's webinar, Adolescent Substance Use, Contemporary Trends in Prevention and Treatment. I'm Tracy McPherson, and I'll be your webinar moderator today. I'm a research scientist in the Public Health Department at NORC at the University of Chicago. I've provided my contact information here in case you have questions about uh, today's webinar or Conrad and Hilton Foundation. You will find our web address, expert.web.com, and our expert.web.com forward slash webinars page where you can access uh, the registration, information, and on-demand learning for all of the webinars in our series. For today's webinar, we have a web page dedicated where you will find the PowerPoint, materials and resources that may be mentioned that we may put up on the web after the webinar. This is where you're going to be able to access the on-demand learning and where you'll be able to request a certificate of attendance. If you would like to ask questions during today's webinar, I invite you to use your questions pane where you can enter your questions at any time during the webinar, and we will follow up with a Q&A that will answer your questions, we'll put it all together, and then we will post it to the same web page where all of the information about the PowerPoints and the on-demand learning will be posted. So now it's my pleasure to introduce our webinar speaker today. We are thrilled to have Dr. Ken Winters who is a senior scientist at the Oregon Research Institute and adjunct faculty in the Department of Psychology at the University of Minnesota. Dr. Winters retired as a professor in the Department of Psychiatry at the University of Minnesota, where he founded and directed the Center for Adolescent Substance Abuse Research for 25 years. Dr. Winters received a BA from University of Minnesota and a PhD in psychology from the State University of New York at Stony Brook. His primary research interests are the assessment and treatment of addictions, including adolescent drug abuse and problem gambling. His recent work in the field has focused on brief interventions and the ESPERT model to address adolescents who are mild to moderate drug users and have co existing behavioral problems. Dr. Winters received numerous research grants from the National Institutes of Health and various foundations and has published over 125 peer-reviewed articles over a 30-year period. Dr. Winters is a frequent speaker and trainer and a consultant to many organizations, including the Hazelden and Betty Ford Foundation, NCRG, and NORC's Adolescent Experts Steering Committee, among others. So, Dr. Winters, welcome, and thank you for presenting and being with us and sharing your knowledge and expertise. I'm going to turn it over to you. Thank you, Tracy. Hello, everyone. Appreciate the introduction. Appreciate the help that you and Misty have done to put this together, and welcome, everyone. Uh, a couple disclosures to kick things off. I do have a personal and commercial interest with an edited book that's briefly noted as background material. And a second disclosure, I hope to avoid a reaction from you that was once voiced by the famous Italian-American physicist Enrico Fermi after he attended a seminar and he said, before I came here, I was confused about this subject. Having listened to your lecture, I am still confused but on a higher level. Hopefully I reach you on a higher level of knowledge, but not have you confused. So my talk is organized around five chapters or sections. So there'll be an introduction section. I'm gonna briefly discuss some developmental issues that are pertinent to service providers. And then the core of my talk revolves around uh, prevention and treatment strategies and approaches with the keys to effective um, practices and programs being the focus. And then I'll provide a summary at the end. So let's start with 
some introduction points. The, in the title of my talk, I use the term contemporary trends. What do I mean by that? I try to organize and bring to bear uh, current research on prevention and treatment uh, with this talk. So I'm, I want you to feel like you're coming away with the uh, state of the art approaches. And then I also have sprinkled in some attention towards emerging issues. Uh, I've highlighted three of them. One of them will be how we can use brain development science as a clinical tool. I, a brief uh, section on the SBIRT model, screening, brief intervention, referral to treatment. And then throughout the talk, I will discuss and uh, bring some relevance to cannabis use in young people. That, of course, is becoming such a uh, contemporary issue these days. So when I'm referring to adolescents, I am going to be uh, talking about the core ages of 12 to 18, so essentially that's middle and high school years. When I refer to substances, I'm going to be talking about alcohol and other drugs. Unless I mention tobacco, um, it's not going to be tobacco uh, in the mix, although there's occasional references to it. But um, the, the issue of tobacco use in teens is, is very important. It would take a separate talk. I don't want you to think I'm minimizing uh, its addictive potential, and surely it is a, a substance. But for the most part, I'll, I'll be focusing on non-tobacco substances. Briefly, some resources. First set are some free ones. Um, here are two uh, free resources that give an overview of, of the field. Somewhat dated are the tip 31 and 32 that came from SAMHSA. Uh, one of them focuses on screening and assessment, the other one on treatment. Uh, quite recent, NIDA put out a research guide manual called Principles of Adolescent Substance Use Disorder Treatment. Um, we'll refer to that pretty soon. Another free resource on treatment comes from Treatment Research Institute called Paving the Way to Change. And then the last two here on this slide are um, contemporary up-to-date uh, resources for screening and assessment. So one comes from the University of Washington. It's an excellent um, electronic library. Summarizes instruments, provides samples of uh, many of them. And a fairly new product from the federal government called the Fenex Toolkit, and an excellent resource for measuring a wide range of behaviors or so-called phenotypes. You use that website by plugging in the content area of interest and it points you to um, tools that a committee has vetted. All the tools in that website are public domain, which can be quite helpful for users. And then uh, the world of SBIRT has uh, blossomed so much that there's several excellent resources. I've put four of them on here that I like. They're, they're all excellent. Um, they, they provide a wide range of user-friendly materials. If you're interested in the SBIRT model, I encourage you to do some um, web searching here and see um, what kind of help you can get from these excellent resources. Now, for a set of resources that cost money, there are three here. They're all edited books. The first two are are ones that focus on treatment, not just of substance use disorders, but also the co-occurring disorders. The first one I've listed has a, a second edition coming out later this year. And then the second one uh, is uh, still quite, quite relevant, even though it's published in 2006. Um, and then the third one is just focused on motivational interviewing with young people. As I hope you will appreciate later on, the uh, the value of this interviewing technique is excellent for teenagers and it's a very important tool you want to have in your clinical toolbox. There are a lot of ways to think about um, and define and to label uh, substance use involvement in, among young people. So with the help of Tammy Chung, here is one way to look at it. And this takes the clinical uh, diagnostic 
substance use disorder uh, definitions and mixes it a little bit with uh, levels and intensity of use. And so with this scheme, you could make a case that there are six categories from most severe to least severe. So at the top, roughly 5% of teenagers would meet a definition of a severe end of substance use disorder. As you may know, DSM-5 uses that term now for, for those that meet six or more of the uh, use disorder symptoms. And then at the bottom, uh, or even though it's the largest part of the base, you have roughly 70% of young people who are either non-users or they're very infrequent with their substance use and, and haven't yet met any uh, uh, criteria for disorder or met any criteria for any symptoms. And then you have a mild, moderate group in the middle, roughly 25%. They would capture both the uh, mild and moderate substance use disorder teenagers as well as those that are starting to use regularly somewhat problematic they might soon escalate to to um, exhibiting symptoms next up some developmental issues with a focus on the importance of addressing substance use early on and um, some background of brain development and how we can leverage that in our clinical work i'm sure most of you appreciate the fact that uh, early onset um, is a harbinger of, of risk for developing a substance use disorder. Um, these bar graphs show for two substances, alcohol and marijuana, the extent to which that is true. Uh, the basic principle is the younger you start using, the greater the likelihood at some point in your life, you will later um, unfortunately have uh, met criteria for addiction. The um, It's quite striking for alcohol. You can see if you start using before age 13, the probability is that, uh, almost at 50% level that you'll develop an alcohol addiction sometime in your life. The pattern is the same for marijuana. It's just that the, the rates of, of achieving addiction are lower. Keep in mind though, the marijuana data here would be based on the type of marijuana that isn't actually all that common these days since the uh, potency of typical marijuana used by by uh, young people and adults is so much higher than in the past and it's likely that that means the um, addictive potential of the drug is is higher nowadays than it was in the past. Michael Dennis has done a great job of, of also showing you the importance of of how early use can have a long-term health effect. So um, this shows you cumulative survival rates based on three groups and the key dependent measure is um, how many years it took the these groups to achieve at least one year of abstinence based on when they started to use so it's an interval of when did you start to use and how many years downstream did it take before you achieved one year of abstinence so these are clinical samples and he broke them into three age groups the uh, red group is the youngest. They, that represents the fact they started using before age 15, and the blue group would be at the far end. They started to use at age 21 or older. Um, and it's striking the difference in so-called, he calls it the, the length of the career. Another way to think about it is uh, if you look way over to the left on the axis for the uh, survival rates, if you look at the 0.5 line, and that 0.5 means that any person or those prior to that, they achieved um, this outcome, one year of abstinence, <clears throat> at 50% of the cumulative group. And you can see for those um, that started later in life using 21 or older, um, it's roughly about age 18 where half of the group have already achieved abstinence. But you can see uh, if you just cast your eyes over, um, it gets much worse if you've started between 15 and 20, and of course it's uh, much worse, significantly worse so, or longer career if you start at under age 15. Under age 15, uh, the 50% survival rate um, has already got people 30 years out. Where the 21 plus group at 30 years out, almost everyone had achieved at least one year of abstinence. 
the first polling question. It's going to be um, to help introduce us to our topic on brain development. So here's the question. Which right or privilege in the U.S. matches where experts place the age at which the brain generally completes maturation? So select one. There's only one correct answer, either the voting age, the age to gamble in casinos, the age it went to rent a car, or the age of serving in the military. Take a moment and choose one that you think is the correct answer. I chose these because these are all either rights of privilege or, for the second one, uh, you know, a, a right to uh, in, engage in a so-called adult indulgence. So, excellent attendees. We have uh, most people selecting rent-a-car, which is the correct answer. Um, and that age for most car rental companies is roughly 25. And, and even though they didn't know about brain science, they were just looking at uh, driving safety data or their actuarial charts and found that roughly about age 25 is when young people uh, get reasonably good at driving a car and, and worth renting it to them. But the uh, neuroscience suggests that um, adolescence is a significant period of development and um, the brain uh, develops in interesting ways throughout the teen years and doesn't roughly complete maturation until about age 25. Two pretty good books that provide um, some, I think, very user-friendly uh, uh, summaries of, of this neuroscience. David Walsh's Why Do They Act That Way, an excellent book. Uh, he wrote it for both parents and teenagers to read. And then I like Anthony Wolf's book. The uh, main title, Get Out of My Life, subtitle, But First Could You Drive Me and Cheryl to the Mall. That subtitle, I think, reflects uh, an important part of adolescent brain development. Um, the second big principle um, that helps us understand brain development is that it's not just that it's taking a long time to develop roughly into the mid-20s, but the way it's developing is an, uh, in, in a particular way that might lead us to better understand why teenagers uh, perhaps are not as thoughtful as we would like them to be or may be more likely to take risks. And uh, the bottom line is that two major parts of the brain, the limbic system and the prefrontal system, are developing in an imbalanced way where the limbic system is uh, developing a little faster, and that's uh, metaphorically considered the gas pedal, where the brake system or the prefrontal system is developing uh, slower. And so, as Casey shows in this figure, you get, um, as someone ages from pre-adolescence to post-adolescence, their limbic system has matured uh, and is somewhat way ahead of the prefrontal region, and you get this imbalance, which suggests that the that limbic region and the parts of, of behavior and, and attitudes and decision making that could be dictated by the limbic system are dominating over the prefrontal system. Prefrontal system um, is often referred to as the seat of sober second thought. So you have um, a part of the brain that likes excitement and interested in fun and perhaps um, overvalue sensation seeking um, is having a tough time because the uh, seat of sober second thought is is getting um, dominated elsewhere. Behavior psychologists have weighed in um, as to how this might uh, help us understand adolescent behavior. Uh, there are eight principles I've highlighted here that come from that literature. And if you read through it, you realize that you know, in some ways this makes sense. It kind of tells us why teens like to do certain things, interest in physical activity, great interest in novelty and in social life. The eighth one on the list, take risk and show poor self-control, is more important for us when we talk about um, substance use. Um, but self-control and decision-making, uh, risk-taking, 
these themes are, are important to look at. They, they're also very normative uh, behaviors and even uh, some risk taking is probably important. One of the findings when uh, this theme has been studied is that teenagers are, are not showing a deficit of viewing risk. It's, uh, however, the problem is certain contextual situations, um, particularly when they're with peers, leads them to engage in more risky behavior. And this is important because uh, it can be a significant uh, theme to teach young people about how to better gauge uh, situations when they're at risk uh, to engage in unhealthy uh, decisions or, or unhealthy behaviors. So why is this important for service providers? I'm going to talk about it in three ways. One is to, uh, I think it's a, a valuable lesson to teach teenagers about the uh, principles of, of adolescent brain development what are some of the uh, assets of that, but what some of the risks, the way that their brain is developing, and also talk about the, the science of addiction and how um, psychoactive substances can impact the brain in significant ways that can contribute to um, overuse and even addiction downstream. Um, at the bottom is a website. Um, uh, it's NIDA's website that provides some, some great um, uh, resources so you can um, actually help teens figure out um, some of the key aspects of brain development and help them learn about the addiction process. So that knowledge base I think can be great leverage to uh, make teenagers understand that they um, uh, have an opportunity to control their behavior in ways they didn't think about and to take more seriously early use of substances. Another important theme to consider when we think about teen brain development is to make sure you're using prevention and treatment resources and approaches that are, I call it teen brain friendly. So it's important, of course, to choose evidence-based programs, but um, you want to make sure that they also um, have features that are going to engage the adolescent. And so uh, they, there has to be a relevance to uh, a treatment program. The teenager has to see that this makes sense for him or her, that it's that the goals being achieved are realistic. I'm also uh, finding it important that uh, prevention and treatment programs should focus on specific skills, particularly decision-making skills. More on that later. Then I want to emphasize how you can also teach parents about brain development. We use this um, one handout with parents, and it's a it can lend itself to a group discussion. Uh, we take the word parent, and then that we use each letter of parent to uh, highlight an important word that reflects a principle about brain development as well as uh, good parenting. So the P is promote activities. A is to assist the children with challenges that require planning. R is to reinforce their seeking advice. E is to encourage a lifestyle that promotes good brain development. The N is never underestimate the impact of a parent being a good role model. And T is tolerate the oops behaviors due to an immature brain or that might result from a developing brain. What's an oops behavior? Well, you know, losing temper, getting too emotional about things. You don't want parents to overreact to that. An excellent website if you also want to point parents to more resources, the partnership at drugfree.org is excellent. And they have resources that span from prevention, intervention, getting treatment, and to help with recovery. So one more uh, developmental question, and it's uh, now an intersection of age and topic of importance today, um, substance use. So for states in the United States that have legalized cannabis for so-called recreational use, what is the minimum legal age? 
So in the US, it turns out all the 10 states that have legalized it, they all have the same minimum legal age. That isn't the case in Canada. If you go north, they just legalize it across Canada. It's a little different in the states. And you see one of the answers is 25, the so-called uh, age and brain development. So excellent, the group uh, nailed that quite well. 72% gave the correct answer, it is 21. 21 is for, for states that have legalized it for so-called recreational use. No one's gone lower than that. It might be because the legal age for alcohol is 21 as well. Canada, it's um, because alcohol is, is uh, legal at age 18, most provinces went with age 18 as the minimum uh, age for, uh, for marijuana use. The uh, next up is prevention. And I'm going to uh, rely heavily on an excellent research-based guide provided by National Institute on Drug Abuse. They have the second edition out. And this provides a range of principles, 16 principles, um, that are keys to effective prevention. So I'm going to summarize uh, these principles by groups of content area. I'm not going to be listing all 16, but I'm going to give you a synthesis of the key themes uh, for uh, these major groups organized around these 16 principles. So the first four principles um, all address the importance of, of risk and protective factors in prevention programs. Um, a basic principle, good prevention programs will enhance protective factors and reverse or reduce the risk factors. Um, and the data suggests that um, a prevention program that addresses all forms of drug of abuse, as opposed to focusing on any single one, um, are actually uh, quite effective. And it does make sense to go that route for all kinds of practical reasons, but just given uh, what we know about teenagers and experimenting with substances, that there's a lot of value in uh, talking about the range of substances as opposed to just um, a, a single one. And there's also great value when a local community um, considers or a local school district considers if there are some specific factors that are more relevant to them and choosing programs or tweaking programs so that you're uh, highlighting those factors that are most pertinent to your target population. An important principle with the risk factor literature is that as the number of risks accumulate, the greater the individual's overall risk of, of substance abuse and other problems. Um, it's often called the snowball effect. So it's the idea is to uh, uh, not just hone in on any single risk or protective factor, but to realize that there are a range of them and you want to reduce as many risks as possible or elevate as many protective factors as possible. The detailed chart on the right uh, is comparing a range of common risk factors for teenage problem behaviors across six different specific problems, substance abuse, delinquency, et cetera. And you can see from the checklist that there's great overlap. So um, it can be comforting to realize if you choose a good program, that is um, so-called right, prepared and developed to address substance use, you also were, would likely be um, uh, addressing many other teenage problem behaviors. The next set of principles um, talk about planning, uh, particularly with schools and communities. And so the, uh, the manual discusses how uh, school programs need to follow some basic principles. The one key is to adjust 
the uh, the curriculum and the content to fit the developmental status of the children. The notion is uh, programs during the elementary school years will uh, focus more on on self control, emotional awareness, problem solving, some of the core decision making principles. And then for young people that are moving into the higher drug use years, um, the focus needs to be on, on some of the peer resistance and peer relations issues, um, or as many call it, the drug resistance skills. And a good system will incorporate, you know, a, uh, a range and a, a, a continuum of programs so that they, those students in the early years were getting skills in, in decision making and then being able to apply it as they got older when they um, got more specific with having to uh, use those skills in, in healthy decision making. I've added a quote from, from a colleague, Larry Shire. This, he means school programs, should arguably provide the biggest bang for the dollar as both low and high risk students are present in school and exposed to the intervention. Um, it, it just speaks to the, the uh, significant cost benefit value of, of uh, school-based prevention programs. Family programs are also addressed in the manual. The uh, uh, significant theme um, is it's very similar to school programs, reducing risk factors and increasing protective factors. Um, these factors are more specific to the, the home and, and family life. This, this slide shows you some of the common ones, that things to reduce and things to increase. They all uh, reflect um, the general principles of family bonding, parenting skills, and communication. Then um, there is the importance of prevention planning. And this is such a, a key when you're doing uh, some of the bigger, uh, more multi-dimensional programs at the community or environmental level. So the manual discusses some of the important principles. And one of the things they emphasize is that uh, if a community can combine two or more effective programs, so have both a school and a family component, for example, it's likely going to optimize effectiveness. A uh, exemplary example is the Communities That Care program. And uh, it's in the literature and been well studied and showing some very outstanding long-term effects. Environmental strategies also can be of value, for example, policies that restrict availability of tobacco, compliance checks regarding access to alcohol are, are ones that have been shown to be effective in the literature. I wanted to comment on a community or environmental based strategy used on college students. And this is organized around the notion of social norms. Um, expert in the field, Wesley Perkins, calls it addressing the reign of error. Um, and it's based on the principle that college students often overestimate how much binge drinking or drinking or drug use is going on around them. And so taking uh, local relevant survey data and then educating students um, about the results often leads to them recalibrating that overestimation. So campaigns like the one I'm showing here with a poster from University of Albany, it says 88% of University of Albany students have partied without using alcohol. So a surprise uh, to most students who would think that it, would, it was much higher, um, or I should say much lower, um, figuring that uh, there's always drinking with partying where it actually isn't the case. This kind of recalibration has been shown to have nice impact on future behavior in the expected direction, reduced binge drinking, reduced drinking, 
and reduce substance use. It seems to work particularly well in the, in the college scene. This might be because of developmental issues, perhaps because um, you got um, the snowball effect of young people living together, um, perhaps all contributes to um, the, the so-called reign of error. So additional prevention program delivery principles that are highlighted in the manual. Um, one of them is to uh, keep in mind it's important to retain the core elements of, of a program, but it's also um, advisable and, 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 and maybe even uh, very important to, when needed, adjust the program to fit the local needs. So there's this uh, important balance to, where you, you don't want to degrade the core too much, but you might have to slightly tweak it to be, uh, to be relevant or pertinent to the local program. And that might mean uh, perhaps uh, there's going to be um, more peer teaching than the uh, school teacher doing the, um, doing the education. Perhaps it means that um, uh, parents are going to work in groups as opposed to parents working individually. Um, and it might mean not implementing some of the elements of a, of a, of a program because they're not the core and, and uh, such ancillary components wouldn't be necessary. And the manual also emphasized the importance of, of trying to have uh, uh, programs that extend through the school year. So uh, not assuming that a one-shot deal is going to work. It was one of the problems with, with the D.A.R.E. program, which only had the, this basically single shot, usually fifth or sixth grade, and there wasn't any continuity. I know D.A.R.E. Uh, has now uh, a newer version that, that has programming throughout the school years. Um, and so to assume that you're going to get much prevention effect by just uh, uh, targeting one school year um, is, is, is flawed thinking. And, and thus, the, you will see now some of the best programs, they, they really have made content and curriculum that, that spans the, the uh, at least the middle and high school, but some of them are grade, middle, and high school years. Okay, third question. It's related to prevention. Which among the following is a sign that drug prevention may be working among students in the US? So is it the rate of students who abstain from all drugs is increasing? Is it that states with legalized cannabis have not seen an increase in use? Or is it vaping has decreased? Which one? Interesting. This is a very, very smart group. The rate of students who abstain from all drugs is increasing. 70% chose that, and that is the correct answer. Although, if you chose the, the legalized cannabis not seeing an increase, there, you might have a, a case to be made for that. But here's the, here's the chart that shows um, this abstinence data. Um, so three grade levels. comes from Monitoring the Futures data, as you may know annual survey in America. Each year, we, um, we get a snapshot of, of 8th, 10th, and 12th grade uh, substance use. And this got charted for you from 1976 to 2013. And you can see the three grades. Um, so it's, it's charting the percent within each grade at each year that said, I haven't used anything yet, or nothing at all. So I've not tobacco, not any other drugs or substances, and, and for sure not alcohol. Well, the eighth and tenth grade, you know, lines are are impressive, but 
remember they they haven't aged yet throughout all the teen years so the to me the most impressive is the 12th grade and you can see that back in the mid 70s only about five percent of 12th graders said they uh, by the time they hit 12th grade almost completed 12th grade because this is done in the spring um, had said they hadn't used anything um, and now we're up to about 25 percent now I know um, Bob DuPont has looked at this data all the way up to 2017 and it's um, that 25 percent is now about 27 percent so uh, perhaps that's a um, a reign of error among uh, among some parents that, um, gee, I don't, how many parents have said, I don't think I can raise a teenager to go through their their school years drug-free, but um, that isn't necessarily the case. And so it is it possible prevention efforts have helped to contribute to this? Um, I'd like to think so. Um, and um, I, one could chart when school prevention started to kick in, when we got real serious with uh, Mothers Against Drug Driving, uh, other prevention community-based uh, initiatives, all of that uh, did start to kick in in the 1980s. And that's when, at least at the 12th grade line, we see um, uh, the, the, the rise, I guess, in the percent of teens not using. So an encouraging piece of data. So I wanted to mention a little bit about Espert. It's uh, in the prevention chapter of my talk because it's um, intended to prevent escalation or of, of drug use, even though we're talking about now a uh, targeted um, prevention group aimed at individuals who have already started to use and in the hopes that uh, a brief conversation or, or brief therapy can um, uh, halt the escalation of use and maybe even uh, bring the person to realize they should stop altogether. I'm going to talk about two challenges. One has to do with the good and bad of this kind of indicated prevention model. And then another uh, subtopic about ways you can adjust implementing ESPERT to fit certain needs and context. So what's the good about ESPERT um, for teenagers? Um, one great um, I think positive is that it helps address a sizable proportion of substance abusing youth where intensive treatment would not be warranted or justified. So back to the, uh, the triangle that was uh, categorizing teenagers all the way from most severe to least severe, um, I'm calling it the uh, sweet spot of the expert model, that, that mild moderate group that was roughly 25%. So they some of them are regular substance users, some of them have already uh, shown some symptoms, but it's either at the mild or moderate level. So a, a very significant portion of young people likely could, um, at one level of thinking, fit an expert model. But what's the bad part about this? So we've got this wonderful large group that we want to capitalize upon um, and not have a missed opportunity, but you also might make a case that it's also a group where most of them are in the pre-contemplation or pre-contemplative phase of their use. As you may know, um, stage of, of change progression model talks about um, five general stages all the way from pre-contemplation, which is where you haven't really thought at all about changing a bad habit. Contemplation is where you've started to think about change. Preparation is you um, know you want to make change and you're preparing to do that by adjusting some things in your life. And then action is where you engage in the change, make the change, show the change. And then maintenance is where you, you hopefully uh, maintain and stay the course. But it's likely many teenagers, perhaps most, in the mild moderate stage are, are stuck in or are situated, if you will, in the, in the pre-contemplation phase, which makes it more challenging for the counselor who are, wants to try to get him or her to, to move a little bit more to the right. In fact, the one thinking is if you can move a person at least one stage to the right or to the more uh, optimistic side, you may double the chance of that individual uh, showing action in the next six months. So 
I always think of ESPERT as typically being applied to teenagers in pre-contemplation, and if I can get him or her to um, exhibit some favorable features of contemplation, I've made some, some good progress. If you can get some action, that's, that's of course, excellent, but you have to be realistic, and hopefully you're planting mustard seeds when you uh, get a teenager to, to uh, at least get unstuck from the pre-contemplation phase and to start to think about maybe some changes that are relevant. The other thing to talk about with SBIRT is how to adjust the implementation plan. Because SBIRT isn't just um, one size fits all, or there isn't just one type of SBIRT. I'm going to show you three examples, all the way from very minimal to more ambitious. I'm calling the first example the minimalist version, uh, or something along the lines of a very brief conversation. And with this model, it assumes you only have a few minutes, maybe 15 or 20 minutes with a teenager, and it's going to be a one shot only. Um, I could envision that you would break the, those 15, 20 minutes up into a few minutes for screening, such as using something called a CRAFT, C-R-A-F-F-T, six item, very brief yes, no questionnaire. It takes just five-ish minutes. You score it right away um, and then have a brief conversation with the teenager that could involve three things, discussing the results of the craft. You could go over the ones they said yes to, get a little more elaboration, then do something called a decisional balance exercise where you're um, asking about why they like to use, what are the pros of using. Um, you get an understanding of the underlying functional value of their use and also the cons. What would be some of the negatives of the use? Have they noticed some things that are not so good about their use? You see if you can get them to um, underweight what they might say are the positives and maybe further appreciate some of the negatives. And then you could briefly, at the end, see if they have any goals, how they might want to change something in their life, maybe related to drug use, but um, with what you've learned from the functional value, you may also realize they have some other issues at hand, and you could suggest some changes in their life uh, to address those issues. Could be done in 15, 20 minutes. Admittedly, it um, might just be getting the momentum going for change. And maybe you can move someone a little bit closer to pre out of pre-contemplation towards contemplation. Second example is what I call standard. Um, this would be also a five-minute screening, such as the craft, and then where you've been able to allocate 60 minutes, and you might either do it over one session or two sessions, but here you're going to be more ambitious. You're going to add more elements and exercises and dig a little deeper into some of the issues underlying the teenager's use and what changes they they may be uh, willing to undertake. So this could involve discussing the assessment, doing the pros and cons or decisional balance exercise, <clears throat> addressing triggers and cravings by seeing if the teenager can talk about what kind of situations or what kind of mood he or she is, he or she is in that contribute to use, discuss peer influences and how that might be leading to some bad decision making, and then you have a chance to also discuss goals. And these goals could include uh, the RT part of ESPER, which is a referral for additional treatment or additional services. The third, I'm calling the Cadillac model, um, very similar to the standard, but what's the difference here? This would be where um, after you do the standard, whether it's one or two sessions, you would consider um, adding more. And this could be uh, a planned booster session where you're following up maybe a month later, or you could right away add sessions because you've realized the teenager's got additional issues, co-occurring problems, and you want to use this opportunity to, to help the teenager with those issues. So in that sense, you're moving past maybe just the, the drug use issues, but also dealing into other behavioral or mental issues and problems. And it might even include 
a more um, sophisticated referral for additional services where you're spending time helping the teenager or the family um, to connect to uh, relevant community services. So all three of these uh, fit within an expert model, but the, what context, situation, clinical demands, and expertise you have are, can dictate uh, which of the examples you, um, you might find um, doable in, in your clinical life. There are studies that have looked at all three of those. My read of the literature is that the, the so-called minimalist approach um, um, doesn't show any, any significant impact unless there's, there's um, additional behavior change opportunities downstream. Uh, but the uh, literature is, is fairly encouraging if, when people can try a standard or, or a more elaborate model. Next up is the uh, the treatment part of the talk with a heavy focus on keys to effective treatment. Fortunately, there are uh, several good recent treatment reviews, two from journal articles and one a, a book chapter. So with the help of these three uh, major literature reviews, I have uh, identified four um, keys to effective treatment. Each of the literature reviews uh, weighed in on these four, so I'm going to walk you through each of them. And I don't think any of them are a big surprise. If if you've uh, uh, worked with young people or or um, had uh, had a good educational background in in substance abuse treatment for adolescents. Um, it's a no-brainer to say, earlier the better. Um, another cumulative survival plot for you that demonstrates this, also from a large clinical database that has been analyzed by Michael Dennis and his colleagues. And this time, the uh, demonstration of the data are that careers are shorter that the sooner the person accesses treatment. So the three groups this time are not age groups, but it's how many years from the time you first used to your first treatment experience. So those that waited the longest, that's the 20 plus group, those that got treatment the earliest, somewhere between first use and, and nine years, uh, that's the blue group. And you can see that uh, Achieving that same dependent measure as the other one, that is from first use to the, uh, the time where you had at least one full year of abstinence, the, that interval from first use to one year's abstinence, you can see the much better picture for those that um, got treatment sooner. If you looked at the 50% the survival point, it's 50% shorter, or the career of um, getting to one year absence is, uh, is 50% uh, uh, in time, as opposed to those uh, that, that waited 20 years to, for, to get their first treatment experience. So earlier the better for treatment, and unfortunately you start your drug use earlier, you also have a greater risk of, of, um, of not only dependence, but having a longer career. Second key point is uh, using evidence-based treatment approaches. So the lay of the land these days is that we're fortunate to have a wide range of programs that could fit our definition of evidence-based treatment. And when they've been uh, studied and compared among themselves or among so-called treatment as usual, uh, an important principle is that the evidence-based programs are, are associated with significantly better outcomes than, than treatment as usual, or which can tend to be multi-dimensional, community-based, but don't follow any uh, particular protocol. It, most of the treatment as usuals that are in these studies are 
are um, based around uh, kind of longstanding uh, standards and traditions of, of a given uh, local program, which might mean it has a lot to do with the leadership of the program, the, uh, the community in which it's based, etc. In two of the summaries by Hogan, Tanner Smith, um, they were consistent in identifying three approaches that they say are, are the best terms of evidence. Family treatment approaches, cognitive behavior therapy, and motivational interviewing, or the broader motivational enhancement strategies. If you were to set up an adolescent treatment program and you had the luxury of, of designing it, um, it's, it, it would be um, quite rational and would behoove yourself to organize that program around these three approaches. And, and they could easily fit within a, um, a, a multi-component treatment package. And along those lines, Hogue looked at some of the common multi-component treatment packages. If you read his article, uh, you'll see there are several um, that he uh, identified and, and looked at their their effectiveness. These four here are the ones that met his definition of either well-established for efficacy or probably efficacious. So MET with CBT is one package. One, another package is MET, CBT with a family component. The third was a family component with contingency management. And the fourth package was MET, CBT plus contingency management. So you can see that they are tapping in the, some of those core strategies that uh, were also identified by others. So let's drill a little deeper into those three. We have motivational enhancement, CBT, and family. Here are five characteristics of motivational interviewing. And not only do they strike me as very relevant to engaging any client, regardless of age, um, about the behavior change process, but it strikes me they're also quite important for a teenager who is at a stage in their life where they don't necessarily want to follow rules or listen to an adult. So motivational interviewing uh, works to de-emphasize labels. It emphasizes personal choice and responsibility. It's more client-centered than therapist-centered. It has strategies where you're, um, you're not um, uh, facing resistance head-on, but you're using reflection and, and non-argumentation skills. And an important feature, it includes the, um, the negotiation of goals and making sure the client is, is vital in setting those goals. I look at this list and realize this, this is very teen friendly. It's friendly for, I think, the entire age group who want to change behavior, but uh, particularly so for teens. Two important features of CBT are that it focuses on immediate, relevant, and specific problems, and it establishes goals that are realistic, concrete, and specific. Teenagers are going to, I think, build a better rapport and a stronger alliance with you if they realize that you're helping him or her with very specific problems that are have immediate concern and for which solutions are realistic. And of course, those can include uh, strategies related to uh, trying to be drug free. CBT can also be helpful in, in teaching and supporting self regulation skills. Here are five dimensions of self regulation, including the bottom two dealing with risk situations and taking healthy risks. So the top three have more to do with how you can um, kind of modulate 
emotional and cognitive dysregulation uh, to support better decision making. And the bottom two have have more to do with um, teenager learning how to understand context of risk and how to change the uh, unhealthy risk to healthy risk. What's healthy risk? Things like taking uh, on new challenges in life that are so-called pro-social, for example, trying something new, uh, not worrying about failure and stretching one's interests and talents to see where they might find some success and not letting failure be a barrier. This is um, basically a fun slide. So a group of us some time back thought, what if there was a different 12-step 12, 12 program for adolescents than the standard 12-step program? And we thought about how there could be 12 steps of self-regulation, not 12 steps of, of recovery. And so we came up with 12 different ways somebody could learn how to improve self-regulation. So here's the list of 12. Some of them are redundant, but uh, we needed to have 12 for, for the bit to work. Um, so if I had the luxury of setting up a treatment program, not only would it have a strong family, CBT and motivational interviewing component, but it would, all of those features would uh, spend a lot of time helping teenagers with uh, self-regulation skills. And then there's the family-based approach. And with this approach, the teenager's drug problem is viewed as a symptom and part of a family unit problem. And so the focus of many goals are on improving uh, family solidarity and, and, and uh, home life. And that often means there's addressing communication issues, cohesiveness, problem solving skills, etc. And thus, the, the whole family is engaged in the therapy, including siblings. A poll question to help us lead into our discussion of 12-step principles. True or false, 12-step principles are included in most adolescent treatment programs. True or false? Select one, 12 step principles are included in most adolescent treatment programs. Interesting. So this time, the answer of the collective group is counter to at least how I see um, the knowledge base on this question. So 30% said true and 70% said false. So you might have wondered, the 12th step wasn't mentioned in any of the literature reviews as at the top, as winning, you know, the um, the contest of of best programs are most efficacious. And 12-step um, is mentioned in these reviews, but the one problem is it's been difficult to document that is it is effective because randomized controlled trials with a typical 12-step program are very difficult to do. Whereas only about 10% of treatment programs base their program solely on a 12-step model, the majority of programs still require some AA or NA participation during treatment. So it interesting, it has continued to be a common component in the adolescent treatment arena. Now, when uh, researchers have tried to look at the effectiveness, you can make a case that there's some reasonable optimistic findings that AA-based or 12-step-based works for young people. There are descriptive studies, so it's hard to know. Um, because now there's an outpatient version called 12-step facilitation, uh, which is 
something that can be done in a little different setting, it can be done individually with group on an outpatient setting. This um, model sets itself up for randomized controlled trials. So I know that there's plans for that, uh, people working on that. So we're gonna be able to find out um, more about how at least a, a version of 12-step looks when it's compared to, to other approaches. It is a barrier though uh, for many young people to uh, resonate readily to the 12-step approach. John Kelly and his colleagues have, have looked at this. Um, here's three major barriers that he notes. All of them have, have you know, some uh, uh, solution to, uh, to help minimize the barriers, but getting teenagers to commit to lifelong changes, for them to easily resonate to a notion of higher power, and the realization that many self-help groups are, are not very teen-friendly can, can pose problems for, for this approach with young people. But if you're interested in more on this, I, I recommend you, you um, read some of John Kelly's work because um, there are some interesting examples of programs that have realized the standard 12-step needs to be adjusted developmentally, and so they have uh, come up with um, uh, variations of it that still maintain the core principles, but provide a, uh, a you know just a more uh, um, uh, tolerable, uh, more adolescent-friendly version, and and likely uh, a better a better connect between uh, the principles and the and the teenager's developmental stage than would be the case if if uh, the standard adult version were were uh, were applied. Third key: the importance of address addressing coexisting problems. The majority of youth have both a substance use disorder and another psychiatric disorder. Um, large clinical sample from Michael Dennis's shop is summarized here. And with this large data set, 61% had at least another sub psychiatric disorder with a substance use disorder. At the other end, only 18% had just a substance use disorder. So it's it's the norm, if you will, to, uh, to have co-occurring. You also have um, multiple problems even for youngsters that, that um, may not even be in treatment, but are um, and have a mild, moderate version of a substance use disorder, and thus may be um, getting their their uh, their treatment with an expert model. So there are four groups here. Far left um, are individuals that have no substance use disorder. They might have had one symptom of DSM-5, but they don't meet criteria for any substance use disorder. Then you have the, the three to the right, mild, moderate, severe. And then in, in each of the columns, there's ranges of how many other problems were on average within that group. And you can see to the right the, the, um, uh, the key and so the darkest colors uh, means the either six or more problems out of 24, and then you can see how it's broken down. Um, and you'll notice if you go from the left column to the right, there's a lot of light colors to the left because people with no substance use disorders, many of them have very few or no other problems. But as you go further to the right, you'll see that the um, um, multiple problems start to stack up. But what's interesting is the mild moderate group in the middle um, also show a, a reasonable percent of, of uh, teenagers that have other problems. Now these are not um, diagnosable psychiatric disorders. They, they include a range of, of uh, health problems, social problems, problems at work. Um, they can include mental health diagnoses or subclinical mental health problems. But the point is, um, you're still getting a lot of co-occurring issues, even with teenagers who don't meet the severe end of the substance use disorder spectrum. The literature talks about 
three general models to help explain why there is this pattern of co-occurrence. They're um, not mutually exclusive, dysregulation model, vulnerability to stress, and self-medication. Um, at this point in the field, I don't, I don't think there's treatment models that are um, yet personalized based on what might be that teenager's particular pathway towards their co-occurrence. But I could see that coming down the pike in the future, because one could make a case if you know with reasonable amount of certainty that somebody is showing the dysregulation pathway towards their co-occurrence, that treatment options might be different than if somebody uh, came to that co-occurrence through self-medication. But um, I, the field is, has mostly looked at what are the theories behind it, what are some of the descriptive data to support the theory as opposed to how that translates to treatment. Hopefully that um, latter part will, will get developed downstream. There are some both assessment and treatment challenges when we're dealing with youngsters with co-occurring. At the assessment level, you have to keep in mind that it is more complex because um, normal adolescents may reflect some subclinical symptoms. And so you really may not have a, a problem or an issue at hand because it's maybe just part of normal adolescence. The symptoms of substance use and mental health disorders can mimic each other. So you, you may think you have co-occurring disorders, but you might not. And if you're interested in trying to figure out which came first, it can be very difficult uh, to assess that. Um, you have to do a detailed interview to and get the youngster to try to place in time when various symptoms might have first emerged. It can be helpful to, to have that time frame in mind because that can give you a clue as to what might be uh, the more primary problem and what and how you might want to allocate um, your treatment resources, but it's it's a difficult thing. Uh, I want to just point you to how uh, problematic it can be to separate out normal adolescence from a clinical problem. So here are the DSM-5 criteria for borderline personality disorder. There are nine criteria. Frantic efforts to avoid real or imagined abandonment a pattern of unstable and intense interpersonal relationships, identity disturbance, impulsivity, recurrent suicidal behavior, affective instability, chronic feelings of emptiness, inappropriate intense anger, and transient stress-related paranoid ideation. So we uh, looked at this list and then um, with some liberalness in mind, identified among these nine what we thought might actually overlap with normal adolescence and we came up with these six. Now keep in mind, uh, if you did a good job of assessing and look for a long-term pattern and, and, uh, and symptoms that were severe, you could separate that out from normal adolescence. But um, having identity issues, impulsivity, interpersonal relationship issues, showing affective instability, feeling empty, uh, inappropriate anger, these are things that one can see in normal adolescence. It speaks to the importance of having um, uh, rigorous uh, background in assessment and understanding that uh, you want to make sure that uh, a, a symptom that might be reported as a yes, however, might uh, also need to be followed up with, well, is it is it chronic symptom? Is it uh, something that has lasted for a long time? Is it something that's impacting functioning at a, at a severe level? Though, when symptoms rise to those criteria, then, then you have likely a bona fide system, a symptom. The uh, standardized tools are your friend. I'm just reminding you of the two websites I pointed to earlier, and they provide uh, some great examples of standardized tools that you can use for measuring uh, mental health problems across the range. Two of them that I like are the Kitty Sads PL and the SCID. A reminder, parents endorse more of the externalizing symptoms, things like ADHD, conduct disorder, oppositional defiance disorder, and teenagers tend to endorse more the internalizing symptoms like depression, anxiety, anger, et cetera. So 
youth tend to underrate whether they have ADHD or not, where parents tend to overrate uh, that, and parents tend to underrate whether the teenager might have depression or anxiety, where the teenager may overrate that. Treatment challenges include, though you have usually greater problem severity, not only greater substance use severity, but also these other co-occurring problems uh, create a, uh, uh, a mixture, um, a cumulative effect of, of more problems to deal with. And it tends to be associated with poor prognosis. And you're likely, because it can be difficult if you have multiple other problems, that uh, you're dealing with a situation where not all of them are being met by treatment. But if you can deal or treat the other problems, you tend to improve the substance use outcomes. This is comparing um, when teenagers just got drug treatment only, that's the orange bars, but the teenagers that got drug plus treatment for psychiatric problems, co-occurring psychiatric problems, that's the yellow bars, two separate groups, one was just alcohol, one was uh, substance use wide. You can see the, the abstinence rates at six months were uh, better if their co-occurring problems were also treated. Roughly a, a 10, 6 to 12% improvement if you treated both uh, sets of domains. Treatment approaches for co-occurring problems run the gamut. I have a list here of six. What's not on the list is meditation and mindfulness approaches. That is virtually untested in the adolescent behavior and substance use disorder arenas, but it's growing in popularity and uh, will, there'll probably be an opportunity to, to get a real good look at uh, uh, outcome data for those approaches real soon because people are studying it. CBT, MET, family therapy, dialectic behavior therapy, 12-step, and pharmacotherapy, main treatment approaches when dealing with uh, co-occurring problems um, in a teenager with already a substance use disorder. And the last point regarding keys to effective a treatment is to have a good recovery plan. Three of them are worth highlighting. Mutual help after treatment um, is uh, very popular and well studied. Mutual help includes both 12-step approaches such as attending AA or NA meetings as well as peer support and recovery coaching. The data suggests the more particularly 12-step participation after treatment, the longer the, the, uh, the better, longer the abstinence or drug-free time or the better the outcome. These are descriptive studies, so it's always hard to, uh, you know, to, to nail down uh, the strength of the effectiveness of that. But um, teenagers that seem to resonate towards the 12-step approach and attend meetings uh, will tend to find a, um, a better outcome trajectory than teenagers that start and, and, and stop the attending. Incentive-based approaches are growing in popularity. The contingency management treatment um, is an excellent behavioral approach to reward drug-free status. That, of course, can be part of primary treatment as well as uh, part of recovery plan. Recovery high schools and colleges I've included because it's an interesting approach, but yet, yet has not benefited from widespread utilization. Um, there are some examples in the country that website would point you to them. You can imagine that uh, a school, whether it's at the high school or college level, that um, is strong on recovery, that includes um, aftercare programs within the school day, are, uh, are a great asset to a, a teenager trying to um, achieve a drug-free lifestyle. So. We don't want to forget about marijuana or cannabis. 
it's likely that nowadays uh, you will see most teenagers with cannabis as their primary um, substance abuse or their primary drug of choice when they're in treatment. These data come from uh, spanning a period that's a few years ago. So I'm, my hunch is that uh, we might even see more dramatic findings. But based on these findings, approximately nine out of 10 adolescent treatment admissions involve cannabis. And that doesn't drop off until you really get into the early 20s when there's a more of a mix. So addressing cannabis is is got to be a, a primary consideration. It strikes me that one thing we don't do very well in any of the um, standard treatment programs is to uh, I call it improve the cannabis IQ of teenagers. Um, I think there's a fair amount of misperception about cannabis in society in general, and it filters down to teenagers. Two websites here if you uh, want to um, tackle this more directly by using uh, this notion of, well, what are the facts about cannabis? What are the myths as a, um, uh, a, a, a treatment leverage point? could be part of a group discussion. You could use it obviously with a client one-on-one. Uh, -on -one. I, I think uh, getting teenagers to realize um, that it's just not a uh, uh, harmless drug and particularly the intensity of uh, and potency on the streets these days uh, do create a, uh, in my mind, a much more uh, addictive substance than in years past. To summarize, employing teen brain friendly prevention and treatment programs and practices are important. They need to um, not only be evidence based, but uh, both relevant and engaging. And um, hopefully, they build skills towards decision making. I was encouraged when I uh, researched this, this talk how many of uh, these so-called evidence-based programs and practices for young people um, really do appreciate the fact that they have to be teen brain friendly. Many of them were developed before some of the science came out, but I think they had a, the authors and the developers had a, a keen sense of what's needed to engage young people. In hitting a prevention home run, um, addressing the important risk and protective factors that are in the family and in the in the teenager, making adjustments developmentally across the age span are both important for uh, effective prevention. I think a wave of the future will be how these programs are more personalized, um, either based on personality traits, uh, perhaps even specific substances of abuse, etc. cetera. Um, will be interesting to see how that plays out. There's, there's, there's a, a small interest among researchers to um, see if the effectiveness of prevention, which is reasonable, but could be uh, improved significantly if, if um, more personalization type models were applied. If I were to set up a treatment program, I'd try to hit a home run by making sure it includes um, motivational enhancement cognitive behavior therapy and family-based approaches. And I would uh, for sure rigorously assess for coexisting problems and, and do what I could to um, supplement treatment to address them. And setting a re relapse prevention plan, of course, is important. I made a case that marijuana has to be on our radar screen as service providers. Another way I want to emphasize this is highlighting for you a literature review from Nora Volkoff and colleagues at NIDA. They published in 2014 an article that uh, uh, assessed the various potential adverse health effects of chronic cannabis use. And they had these different layers, low, medium, high level of confidence of where the health effects um, and marijuana might be linked. 
several of them that I put in red, uh, these health effects were more significant or more enhanced if marijuana use began during adolescence. And so these were altered brain development, cognitive impairment, increased risk of chronic psychosis disorders, addiction, and diminished life satisfaction. So to close, if you get discouraged from working with adolescents as a service provider, remember this principle, adolescence is a time-limited disorder. Thank you. Yes, and Dr. Winters, thank you so much for all of the rich uh, information that you've shared with us and sharing your expertise with us. There's so much depth and breadth to what you shared with us. I know this will be an enduring resource for many, and uh, I'm certainly looking forward to uh, listening to it on demand, and I would encourage others who have really benefited from uh, your talk today to share it with their colleagues, with students, with practitioners, uh, any, any way that we can really sort of grow up and build the workforce and bring them up to date in terms of contemporary trends. So thank you, Dr. Winters. Uh, this was excellent. And we uh, welcome you back to share more of your expertise. In the last few moments, I'd just like to remind everyone that we have a dedicated web page for this session. If you go to the expert.webs.com website, you can click on the webinars tab and you can find all of the information there, or you can go directly to this URL where we have forward slash adolescent hyphen use hyphen trends. So you're gonna find all the PowerPoints. You'll be able to request a certificate of attendance. This is where it will be made on demand 24 seven. And also uh, we will be following up with you uh, with more information. I, I do hope that you will take advantage of the additional webinars in this series and we'll be sharing more information with you about that. And last but not least, if you have questions about expert implementation, evaluation, or training, you're interested in knowing more about the adolescent expert work that we're doing with the Conrad Hilton Foundation, learning more about the resources that are available to you, uh, curriculum and training materials, access to technical assistance telephonically, and questions about evaluation. Uh, you're welcome to contact the expert team at norc.org, or you can contact me directly. And finally, I want to thank uh, everyone for uh, attending and participating with us today. I know that you all benefited uh, from this as much as I, I did. And we will conclude today's webinar uh, by saying thank you and encourage you to visit our website. And I wish everyone a great day. Thank you.